I'm going to be in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 11 through 20. And Nehemiah has the go-ahead from Artaxerxes the king to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild. He has the earthly king's approval, and he has the heavenly king's approval. However, there's still a challenge. That is the building itself. He's also going to have to inspire the people to build and not be intimidated by the amount of rubbish in their face. If you're going into the work of the Lord, there are in-your-face challenges. And here are some ways to go at these challenges head on. So, Nehemiah 2.11. In Nehemiah 2.11, Nehemiah says, So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. So he came to Jerusalem. That's the first thing. You head into the work. The biggest step so far in Nehemiah facing the challenge was simply heading to Jerusalem. After he got the approval from the king, the, the next biggest step is just heading into the work. And I don't know about you, but if you're a hesitator, hesitators are not up for a challenge. Uh, Nehemiah could have put off the work because of the dread. He could have put it off because of the fear. Or he could have got off into being preoccupied with the world like Demas. You know, in 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul talks about Demas. He said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. But the scriptures, the scriptures are your spiritual alarm clock going off. They're calling you into the work. Paul says, redeem the time in Ephesians 5, 16 and Colossians 4, 5, redeeming the time because the days are evil. You're not getting any younger. You, you shouldn't hesitate. You're not getting any younger. And Paul proclaims, he, he says, knowing the time, it's high time to awake out of sleep in Romans 13, 11. You see, you can't build on the foundation if you won't even head into the work site. So you need to overcome these hesitation problems, your fear. 2 Timothy 1.7, The Lord has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You need to overcome your slothfulness. Proverbs 19.15 It says, Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. These are challenges before you face the challenge. Many Christians get saved and then they never grow in grace. Second Peter 3.18 says, Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They never go on into perfection. They never even lay the foundation. As Hebrews 6 talks about, you know, over there in Hebrews 6, in verse 1, it says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying out of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. You know, you need to already have the foundation laid and be going on into perfection. But hesitators, they won't even face the challenge. To face the challenge... You literally got to show your face to the challenge. You know, at work, you get a lot of people, they won't even come in to work or they're late. You know, I have people that don't show up on their first day. You know, when somebody misses their first day, usually it's not too promising. But you got to show up. You got to head into the work. You can't hesitate too much. Now, the next thing, in Nehemiah 2 and verse 12, Nehemiah says, And I rose in the night, I and some few men with me. Neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. So the next thing is, you need helpers in the work. Nehemiah knew he needed at least a few men with him. So in verse 12, he says, I and some few men with me. There are great benefits in not going into the work alone. And that is heavy burdens become lighter. You see, Nehemiah didn't have a lone wolf type of mentality going on. He took a few men with him 
and the work is going to have heavy burdens and he would need more than one man to carry a beam those heavy burdens would become lighter you know through the book of nehemiah you're not going to see nehemiah build it by himself he has helpers in the work the christian work has heavy burdens that you need to bear paul had work fellows romans 16 12 he had fellow helpers second corinthians 8 23 he had fellow soldiers philippians 2 25 he had yoke fellows philippians 4 3 he had women which labored with him, Philippians 4, 3, and fellow laborers, Philemon 23. He was not a lone wolf. He knew heavy burdens become lighter when you got some people with you. Sometimes it's only going to be you and God. But it doesn't always have to be that way. And other members of the body helping you is also Jesus Christ helping you because they are the body of Christ. So you need helpers in the work, and they make your heavy burdens become lighter. The next thing, you need your heart into the work. Nehemiah had it in his heart to do this great work at Jerusalem. He said, God had put in my heart to do this great work at Jerusalem in verse 12. He says, And I arose in the night, I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither there was neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. So you need your heart into the work. You need to be hooked to the ministry. Nehemiah wasn't forced into this. He wasn't doing it for fame or money or recognition. He was wholeheartedly directed to the work. And if you're going to take down any giant challenge, you must have the heart to do it. You have to give yourself wholly to the work. And over there in 1 Timothy 4.15, 1 Timothy 4.15, uh, Paul tells Timothy, meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. You give yourself wholly to it. Put your heart and soul into it. Be hooked to the ministry. So the things that you're doing for the Lord, the things of God can't just be out of obligation, even though it, you should do it for that too, or even just to sustain your fellowship, although that's one reason why you do it. It needs to become your lifestyle. It needs to become your favorite thing. It needs to become your hobby, the thing you enjoy until you eat and drink and breathe and speak the scriptures until you're thoroughly furnished into all good works. 2 Timothy 3.17 Give yourself wholly to them. Addict yourself to the ministry like 1 Corinthians 16.15 talks about. Put your heart into the work. If you're going to face any challenge, first you got to head into the work. You got to be there. You got to show up. You got to have helpers in the work. You can't do it on your own. You got to have your heart into it, or you're going to do a sloppy job, or it's just going to, you're going to get overdriven. You're going to get too burdened down. You're going to get burnt out. But if your heart's into it, you enjoy it and you want to do it. Now, the next thing, there's going to be hindrances in the work. Now, look at Nehemiah 2, verse 13. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Then went I up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned. You see, Nehemiah was in the dark by the dragon well and the dung port and his beast couldn't even make it through the rubbish. So you got hindrance in the work, hindrances in the work. You got heaps of rubbish. There was so much rubbish and debris that there was no place for the beast that was under Nehemiah to pass. Sometimes you try to live right and you're entangled with the affairs of this life. 
you know, Second Timothy two four says, "No man that that warreth it, get." Let's turn to it. I don't, I don't want to mess it up. Second Timothy two four says, "No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier." You see, sometimes you get entangled in the affairs of this life, going through all the rubbish. Sometimes men are so engulfed in entertainment that they can't make it past their TV cords and their Ethernet cables and their HDMI cords. Now they can't see how tangled up they are because they've gone wireless. So remove the heaps of rubbish. Sometimes you can get overwhelmed in the work because there's so much to be done everywhere. You need to pick a place and start after you remove the rubbish. Start with what is right in front of you and start getting rid of it bits at a time you know in hebrews 12 1 lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us let us lay aside every weight so that you can have room to fit you know there wasn't any room for the beast that was under nehemiah to pass so you got to remove the rubbish so you, you can get you can fit through what you need to fit through you got heaps of rubbish you've got haunting foes in Nehemiah 2, 14 and 19, it says, Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to, to pass. He says in verse 19, But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? So you got haunting foes. The dragon well can picture the great red dragon who hindered Paul. 1 Thessalonians 2.18. He talked about Satan hindered him. That dung port can picture past sins that Satan brings up to accuse you. Revelation 12.10 because he's the accuser of the brethren. And they make you feel unworthy to face the challenge. And you're going to have your Sanballat and Tobiah who scoff at your message. Second Peter 3.3 3 talks about scoffers you're going to face. They were trying to make it seem as if Nehemiah was in rebellion against the king. And the wicked world will label you as rebellious because they love to call evil good and good evil. But when the world's so wicked, rebellion becomes godly sometimes but the thing is nehemiah wasn't in rebellion he had the king's approval he had the earthly king's approval and the heavenly king's approval he's not rebelling against anybody but these people just love to call evil good and good evil so that way they can brainwash people into thinking you're the bad guy you're the enemy isaiah 5 20 they love to make people think backwards but that's what you're going to face you're going to have hindrances in the work heaps of rubbish rubbish Maybe you're, you look at your life, you examine your life, and you got so much sin in your life everywhere, you don't even know where to start. Just like Nehemiah and the people started, you start getting rid of the rubbish one bit at a time. That's the way you can go when you get rid of the stuff out of your life, one bit at a time. And you let God work on you one bit at a time and the next thing with nehemiah he hyped up the work look at verse 16 and 17 it says and the rulers knew not whither i went or what i did neither had i as yet told it to the jews nor to the priests nor to the nobles nor to the rulers nor to the rest that i that did the work then i said unto them you see the distress that we are in how jerusalem lieth waste and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. So Nehemiah told the people about the distress that they're in, and exhorted them to build, so that they would be no more a reproach. He had a desire for a better Jerusalem. 
You see that? He wanted a better Jerusalem. And you need hope for a better city. Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11.10. Paul had a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Philippians 1.23. He said to set your affection on things above. Colossians 3.2. While the world is earning their corruptible crown, we are running for an incorruptible crown. 1 Corinthians 9.25. You see, the world faces many challenges that they compete for just corruptible things. We're doing it for eternal rewards that will go into an eternal city. That should hype you up for the work. Your hope for a better city. You're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Nehemiah said, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. Hope for a better city that is not of this world where you won't be a reproach, but a royal citizen. Should That should give you the motivation to build and add excitement and hype to your Christian service. And not only that, but you have your hand, the hand of God in the work. That ought to hype up the work. Just the fact that the hand of God is in the work. And Nehemiah 2, 18 through 20, he says, Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words. See, he had the heavenly king's approval, the earthly king's approval. And they said, Let us, the people said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it. They laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? No, they already have the king's words. So it says in verse 20, Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build, but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. So, the hand of God's in the work. Nehemiah assured the people he had the hand of God on his side and the king's words. So heaven approves. When heaven approves, you can have boldness. When you face the challenge or the challenger, you have that extra boldness because you know God Almighty and heaven, heaven itself is on your side. It doesn't matter if the world approves. It doesn't matter about those guys. That was just mentioned in verse 18. You, have, you got the hand of God on your side. And he is for me. And if God be for me, who can be against me? Romans 8, 31. Who cares if Sanballat and Tobiah are against us? None of their weapons shall prosper. Isaiah 54, 17. But the Lord God of heaven shall prosper us. So if you're ever going to do anything for the Lord, you're going to have to at least head into the work site. You got to get up and go. You got to go there to do anything. That's the first step. You know, a factory, a restaurant, or any job you can think of doesn't function well with nobody showing up. It doesn't function well with just one man. So you're going to need helpers in the work. A workplace doesn't function properly without the people's heart being in it. So you got to have your heart into it are showing up and being there, it's not going to do you much good. You're not going to get much done if your heart's not into it. And there's going to be hindrances. You can't expect to go into work and not face problems. So there's going to be hindrances, haunting foes, heaps of rubbish. But this only leaves you looking and longing and hoping for a better city. The more hindrances you run into, the more haunting foes you run into, that just leaves you looking for a better city. It leaves you hoping for something better. You don't want this world to get looking too good down here anyway. So you can work with boldness because you know you got God's hand in the work and heaven approves. And what you are doing has eternal value.